Welcome to the Registers Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. This show is about Plymouth County real estate. The show is being taped in October, but we're talking about the September activity at the Registry of Deeds. We're going to talk about our numbers. I have a great guest in the second segment, Bill Cohane of the uh, Community Preservation Commission in Plymouth, and talk about some of our notable land records and one of our Plymouth colony records. So let's go right to the numbers. As far as sales go in September, there are 887 sales of property, less than the 1158 in August, slightly more than last year. For the first nine months of the calendar year, we're down 6%. You're going to see a listing of sales across the 27 communities of Plymouth County. Uh, Plymouth and Brockton have been one, two, and will continue that way. Every community's had some sales activity. Uh, as far as mortgages go, there are a lot of people taking advantage of low interest rates to refinance. There were 2,302 mortgages recorded in September, more than the 2,240 in August, up 49% compared to last year, and that tells you th that people are taking advantage of low interest rates to refinance. And for the first nine months of the calendar year, we're up 10% as far as mortgages go. People are still using mortgages to purchase property, but a lot of people are refinancing. We continue to follow foreclosure deeds. Foreclosures have been an issue since 2008, way less than they were during that troublesome time. Only 33 foreclosure deeds recorded across Plymouth County in September, the same number as August, 25% less than last September, 44% lower than last year. We also track foreclosure notices. It's the first document somebody gets when they're facing difficulty, usually for non-payment of the loan. There were 50 foreclosure notices recorded in September, less than the 53 in August. And you're also going to see a list of foreclosure deeds and notices from each of our 27 communities. And in this case, Brockton and Plymouth have also been the, the highest. Um, in this particular month, um, P Pembroke was pretty high, and it, on the notice side, Wareham was very high. So everyone should try to be aware, and if you need help, if you're facing difficulty making your mortgage payments, try to reach out to a federal housing counselor to try to modify your loan. Um, our training room, we have a free training room opportunity that would be open next on Thursday, November 7th, the first Thursday of the month at 9 o'clock. If you're interested in a way to efficiently search our site, uh, sign up. Um, please be aware that effective December 31st, there will be fee increases on all documents at the registry except for homesteads. There'll be about a $30 uh, a piece increase in recording fees starting on the 31st of December and going into next year. We have a memo on our website, PlymouthDeeds.org, that describes the cost of every document going forward. Um, it goes to community preservation, and we have Bill Cohane coming in, the chair of the Community Preservation Commission, talking about some of the great programs being undertaken, undertaken by the Town of Plymouth uh, Community Preservation uh, Committee. So um, we'll see Bill in the next segment. Thank you very much for this watching this show. Welcome back to the Registrar's Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Registrar of Deeds of Plymouth County. In this segment of the show, we always try to do something educational. We've had commercial real estate brokers, a lot of realtors, assessors, appraisers, and a whole number of people involved in the real estate of Plymouth County. I have a great guest on the show who's been here before, Bill Cohane, who's the chair of the Plymouth uh, Community Preservation uh, Organization. And Bill, you've been here before. Why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about your role? I know you're also a realtor, but <laughs> sure. you're all, as far as community preservation. 
Uh, thank you, John, for having me on. Sure. And uh, yes, I have uh, served the Community Preservation Committee as its chairman since we adopted it on May 11, 2002. Uh, we're moving into close to our 17th year. We just got done with Spring Town Meeting. Uh, we're finishing up some activities from Spring Town Meeting and Fall Town Meeting. And uh, one of the projects that we're working on right now uh, is focusing our attention on our town square. Plymouth is in, moving into its 400th year of, uh, of recognition of its history. Uh, uh, the Community Preservation Committee and town meeting and uh, a number of residents have been very interested in uh, Town Square. And on Town Square we have our 1749 courthouse, we have the National Pilgrim Memorial Meeting House, the former Unitarian Church that's currently under restoration with CPA funding which was passed in the spring, the fall of 2018. Uh, that work will be completed by the end of this year. Uh, all new roof, all new sidings, the building will be tight to the weather. Uh, Mayflower Society, the new owners of the building are making it into a uh, orientation center. Mm -hmm. uh, they're fundraising for the interior work uh, and they uh, hope to have uh, some news in early 2020 where they are there but our focus has been in recent months on the 1749 courthouse I think we have a few photos of the of the building itself um, available um, well, and that's a that's a great project and, yeah um, in our building at the registry of deeds we have identification of all the sites right. along the way beginning in the 1620s Correct. Where deeds were kept and yeah. deeds were operated from, and yeah. uh, that building uh, was a ship captain's house originally. Correct. And it was the site of a government house. Yep. And then it was torn down and rebuilt yep. as the 17. 49 courthouse. Exactly. It's, it is the, the 1749 courthouse in our town square is the oldest wooden municipal uh, building in North America. And you're right, it dates back to the early 1630s uh, where the land is conveyed to a Plymouth resident. Her name was Mary Brown. She married okay. Mr. Thomas. Uh, they yeah. built a home there. And uh, they, when they uh, left Plymouth in, seven, in 1657, the colony took the property. That was the tradition at that time. There wasn't uh, the normal real estate transactions we see today uh, that the colony took control of the property in 1657 and started using it as a co colony house mm -hmm. where business was done and where court magistrates came and legal documents were prepared and uh, decisions were made in the early colony. And that uh, tradition carried on uh, well into the 1680s when they added to to the original Thomas House. Um, eventually, Mr. Thomas, the shipbuilder, uh, eventually finds himself in New York City and he's the first mayor of New York City. Right, right. Interesting little footnote. But from the 1680s, uh, the building is altered. Uh, again, it's altered in the early uh, 1749 is when it's t entirely taken down and rebuilt, but rebuilt with the original materials. Nothing mm -hmm. was wasted back mm -hmm. then. We're involved in an RFP went out for a new roof, a new siding. Uh, we're in the process of putting those materials back on the building um, and it has been exciting to know that the building is going to look its best uh, in, in 2020. It uh, hasn't looked this good since its initial restoration in 1970. It's kind of an interesting story. Uh, back in 1970 they planned to demolish the building along with about another 187 houses over by the Governor Carver and Spring Hill Apartments. Uh, it was some activists here in Plymouth that fought to save the 1749 courthouse. They actually had to get the United States Senator, Senator at the time, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, to change the law to allow this federal money to go to restoration rather than demolition, and they saved the 1749 courthouse. And we're happy to be uh, 50, 60 years later uh, making a major effort to restore the building to make it look more historically accurate uh, to the year in which it uh, came from. So whenever I bring a visitor there, I'm reminded of how many courts were operating out of that little building. Right. Uh, every, uh, every court in Plymouth County, because yeah. there were no other courthouses at the yeah. time, exactly. operated out of that building and the town of Plymouth. Exactly. So around the, uh, at the time when they opened up the 1820 courthouse, right. uh, the town of Plymouth is operating uh, out of its meeting house. 
Uh, and around the 1830s, that's when the Commonwealth of Massachusetts really starts to enforce the separation of church and state. And they told the town of Plymouth, you could not operate your town government out of your meeting house, which was acting as a church on Sundays. So they walked across the street to the 1749. At that time, I think they negotiated a sale and bought the building for a couple of thousand dollars from the county. And the town moved into it in uh, the, in the uh, 1830s. And they were there until the 1950s when they moved to Lincoln Street. And then in 2017, they moved into the 1820 courthouse as their new town hall. But it must have been a huge move for the Registry of Deeds, probate, and the court to go from that small GM facility right. up to the 1820 courthouse, which is now your town hall. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. During the renovations of the 1820 courthouse into our new town hall, in the basement of that building, we found a vault and we opened it up and we found quite a bit of probate documents. Uh, uh, documents, and I know I've worked with Matt McDonough and yourself to kind of identify right. and preserve those documents, right. but we found different documents that had been stored in the 1820 but had been prepared uh, and created over at 1749. So let's talk a little bit more about what you envision Town Square will look like by the time we get into 2020. Well, at our uh, spring town meeting, uh, we uh, passed an article uh, to put $160,000 aside as CPA funds uh, to redesign the surface area of Town Square. Currently, the Town Square has an appearance that was designed around the 1960s urban renewal. They came in, they pulled up uh, the material, and here's a nice picture where you can see oh, sure. uh, Town that. Square uh, in the early 1820s. I think this is 1828. And interesting, you can see on the lower left-hand corner, there's the there's the um, uh, 1749 courthouse. But you'll see a little boy sitting on something, and that's the Plymouth Rock. The oh, Plymouth wow. Rock used to be in Town Square uh, for for a number of years, and there's a gentleman standing next to the, the boy that's sitting on the rock, and behind it is the 1749 courthouse. Right. This is around 1828. Okay. And, and that next, was one of the churches at the top of that the That was one of the meeting houses. Again, there's another rendering of that. Um, we can go on to the next slide. Sure. And here is uh, the final meeting house that was built in 1892. This was built uh, of stone. It's a brick building with a, uh, a, a facade, a veneer of stone, and it's under restoration right now. That's the meeting house. To the right, you can see the staircase going up to Burial Hill. Mm -hmm. And on the left, you can see uh, these trees in Town Square. The one on the left is called the Liberty Tree. Uh, there's one down on the far right that they used to call the Town Tree, where you put town notices. Uh, and the, the tradition of our Town oh, Square, oh it was like the modern <laughs> Facebook page. It went to the tree to see the news. But it, uh, the four trees were a tradition in Town Square. Um, the first one came down in a hurricane, a blizzard in 1886, and the last one, which is the one up on the upper left-hand corner, came down in Hurricane Carol in 1954. The next slide shows the staircase mm -hmm. uh, when it was open, new. Yeah. You can see down there on the street uh, the granite and the cobble that was used sure. on the square. These are some of the materials that we're going to try to gravitate back oh, to. Great. The next slide can show you downtown Plymouth where you can see some more cobble. and uh, so. Um, we're kind of researching these photos to see what the photos offer into uh, some evidence of what the town square surface area might have been like because it's been some time since they pulled up the old and put down the new. Uh, the next slide shows you again looking up. Right. Um, you can see here in the, the little gutters used to be of stone cobble as late as the 19. This looks like it's the uh, maybe the um, late 40s. Next slide. Again, this seems to be uh, just before the war or just after it in the 40s. Um, again, there's Town Square. This is a nice picture of Town Square. Uh, a lot of parking. The, the car really changed Town Square. When the car was introduced, it really uh, changed what Town Square became. You can see on the left there were more businesses on Town Square mm -hmm. because there was more foot traffic. Um, during the urban renewal efforts, the foot traffic went away, the stores went away, became more isolated. We want to bring those amenities back. The next slide shows a uh, Leiden Street mm -hmm. in, in some of the cobble use. Some of this restoration work will go down Leiden Street so when the tourists... So on the bottom left would have been where the common house was. Correct. And we hope to get Leiden Street in a condition that as you walk by it as a tourist, at Water Street, you'll see it's different and follow it up to Town Square, kind of like the Feedroom Trail in Boston. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the next slide shows, this is again the 1749 courthouse looking at the square itself. So I always tell people if you really want to walk in the footsteps of the colonists, to start at the Bradford statue, right, and then walk up on the left side yep. of Leiden Street, right, exactly. I mean, because all Leiden, the way up to the fort. Yeah, Leiden Street being initially called First Street, yeah. um, one of the first streets laid out in North America. Yeah, book um, one, page one of the county records for real estate. The deeds is a handwritten document by Bradford, right, and and his handwriting lays out who was granted the land on that left-hand side of the road. Exactly. And this this is the 1749 courthouse when it was under restoration okay. in 1970. Um, a lot of demolition along the way around it. Sure. Next slide. And this is uh, a, a, a oh, number of tours. You can see on the right there's a stone with a, a memorial to Meta Comet, mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, during the King Philip Wars, uh, he was, uh, he was, uh, when they lost the wars, uh, his, his remains were displayed in town square on a pole mm -hmm. uh, for many years, which is very uh, uh, heart wrenching for the native people. This site, town square, does have uh, moments where the native people and the pilgrims had very positive events. When Samoset walked into town square and he saw Governor uh, Bradford and Miles Standish and said, welcome Englishmen, for 50 years they worked together. It wasn't until the King Philip's War where things deteriorated rapidly and uh, as a result there is a, a monument to that story. Here is an example of brick that we have reclaimed from the 1820 courthouse using around Plymouth. Hopefully we'll use it in town square on part of our surface area, but this is the Bradford water fountain uh, a fountain uh, on um, Leiden Street the next square next slide you can see this is granite from 1820 courthouse and the 18 uh, 57 jail out back. We use parts of the foundation as benches around town. Right. Beautiful hand cut granite so from Quincy. Town hall complex. Yeah, and this is all hedge brick. This is an example in Nantucket of what they mm -hmm. have been able to preserve on their main street sure. in their square cobble, brick, granite. Uh, some of this might be conducive to our town square. We always have to keep an idea on the maintenance and future maintenance and snow removal uh, and how that interacts with the equipment and the, and the materials. The next slide shows, uh, again, uh, use of uh, granite and brick mm -hmm. um, showing uh, in cobble, mm -hmm. showing uh, the surface areas to be unique and different. This is again in Nantucket. Here's mm -hmm. another example of some of the stone. These stones were actually dug up on a street that had been buried years later, but they brought them back and they preserved them and wow. they, now people walk on them again. Here's another example of granite bollards that could be in town mm -hmm. square that would uh, kind of control the traffic levels and make the place uh, town square more friendly to pedestrians. And next, here's some more examples of in New England where they've taken their town squares and introduced these materials too. The next, um, another example of mm -hmm. cobble. This is up in um, Vermont. Okay. Next slide. Again, here is uh, down in, uh, on the Cape where they have their brick and their granite and their stone kind of uh, mixed together. Uh, but in a way that people can move about it safely. So when I walked in the door of PAC TV today, a woman who wants to talk to you afterwards came up to me and said, are you the bell man? <laughs> and I know years ago we talked about yeah. the restoration of the bell, yep. and you actually had to have an easement mm -hmm. up, up to the bell because yep. it was a church. Yeah. So in the town square, towering above, yes. there is a cupola in the in the meeting house, and in that meeting house, we have a town bell, mm -hmm. and it's uh, we just came from town meeting a couple of weeks ago, and we approved thirty five thousand dollars to restore the town bell. Now, town bell, town of Plymouth has an interesting history with the bell. The bell in the town started around the 18, uh, 18 excuse me, sixteen sixty nine. The town of Plymouth gets a bell. It's the first town in New England to have a bell. Prior to that, it was using a drum to summon people to meetings. Mm -hmm into service. But Plymouth gets a bell and they put it in their meeting house and it's uh, it rings uh, for some time. So it would have been two or three buildings before that. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. So yeah. the first meeting house was the fort, yeah. there was a second meeting house, then there yeah. was the third. Okay. Um, and uh, later on around 17 
31, the bell cracks. Oh. Interesting enough, town meeting forms a committee. The committee decides to cast a new bell and gather more materials. The bell casters came to Plymouth and in around 1734, they cast a new bell. And that bell is ringing right up until about 1794 when a Mrs. Russell, who had been born in Plymouth but had married a wealthy British merchant and moved away, she wanted to give uh, the town of Plymouth a gift and she gave it a bell. So the town gets the Russell Bell in 1794, this bell arrives. We're not really sure if the material from the earlier bells made mm -hmm. it into this bell. It was a gift, it went up, and it rang until 1801. It was a short ringing bell, it cracked again. Uh, this time the selectmen enter into a correspondence with Colonel Paul Revere in Boston, and uh, they decide to commission the Paul Revere Bell, and that bell is commissioned in 1802. It's brought to Plymouth, it's put up into the meeting house, and it rings until 1892 when there's a fire in the fourth meeting house, a big wooden Gothic church. It crashes into town square. Wow. The bell breaks. Uh, at this point, we gather up the pieces of the Paul Revere Bell, and we make contact with his grandson, who owns a bell company in Boston called the Blake Bell company. Uh, the son was called Hooper, his last name was Hooper, and they cast a new bell. The bell comes to Plymouth in 1898, and we put it up into our meeting house tower, and it has been ringing, it rang until 1976 when the rocker, uh, the rope, broke, and the bell went silent. And in 2005, town meeting used its CPA funds to repair the bell, mm -hmm. but what we did notice this spring when we were meeting with the bell company that operates our equipment, we were having difficulty getting the bell on daylight savings time. The computer that runs a hammer that hits it, it doesn't have a rope anymore. We were having difficulty with it. It's kind of interesting, the bell is a curfew bell. It only rings at uh, seven o'clock in the morning to tell you to get out of bed. <laughs> it tells you at noon to have lunch. It, it rings only at 6 to tell you to go home from work, wow. and then it rings again at 9 o'clock at night telling you to go to bed. Wow. So the bell had a tradition of, wow. uh, that was, had, has been going on for some time, and we were having difficulty getting the computer to operate, and that's when the bell company told us we needed to get a survey of the bell because the bell needed some work. And we did get the survey. The survey said that it was going to be about uh, $35,000 to restore the bell. What we want to do this time is we're going to add a new computer and hammer to the bell to ring it, but we want to bring back the rocking element. So we're going to bring back the rocker with the yoke of the bell where it hangs uh, so that you can pull a rope and the bell will oh, ring right. for the first time since right. 1976. But I have one short funny story about the bell. Next to our town bell, there's this uh, large apparatus called a caroline with a series of bells, which is an instrument that you play. Right, right, and it's sure. owned by the Mayflower Society now, and, and it can be played. It's a numerous bells with different notes. And there used to be a gentleman who would play that instrument. And there was a former town meeting member uh, from Precinct 1, Enzo Monti, told me an interesting story. When he was in the service away from Plymouth, he was reading um, uh, Time magazine. I think it was Newsweek magazine, and there was a story that appeared uh, apparently on New Year's Eve in 1947, the bell ringer had too much libations <laughs> and climbed up into the tower and started playing the Caroline. <laughs> and he kept on playing the St. Louis Blues until three o'clock in the morning. Oh my God. And the town police came out, they surrounded the building, and they tried oh to convince him to come down, and he wouldn't. He just kept playing and playing, and finally he yeah. fell asleep. Oh and God. When he fell asleep, that's when uh, the police were able to get yeah, him. Yeah, stop the bell. <laughs> but Plymouth's had a long history with the bell, but it's, it's great to see the bell's going to be in complete working order. It's the first time since 1978, 1976 in, in 2020. Those are great stories. Yeah. Can you share your contact information in case anybody wants to get in touch with you about some of these things? Uh, contact information will yeah. be the Community Preservation yeah. Committee yeah. Uh, for the Town of Plymouth. You can reach us at 508-747-1620, uh, Community Preservation Committee um, at Town Hall, which is 26 Court Street in downtown Plymouth. And Plymouth has used this community preservation money very well. So when people are paying the increased fee on December 31st and forward, knowing it's going to community preservation, they should understand that 
those are the kind of projects that it funds. But it also does a lot of to preserve land, right. to protect water and habitat. Yeah. And we also do a lot of construction uh, around community housing. housing There's right. a housing crisis, crisis on the South Shore right. and the Community Preservation Committee has been doing what it can to protect and, and build community housing. Oh, great. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. As always. always. Good job. Yeah. So welcome back to the Registers Report. Again, my name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. In this show, we do the third segment, something lighter in nature. Um, I want to thank Bill Cohane for the great job he did in describing some of the Community Preservation Committee's uh, activities within Plymouth. Some of them are in incredible in terms of promoting the history of Plymouth Colony and Plymouth County. Uh, so in this segment of the show, we talk about some of our notable land records. Uh, holidays for the month were Yom Kippur um, on, a, on the 8th, Columbus Day on the 14th, National Chocolate Day on the 28th, and Halloween on the 31st. But we're going to talk a little bit about baseball. As this show is being taped, uh, we're into the sixth game of the World Series, but there's only been one person born in Plymouth County inducted into Cooperstown. His name was Mickey Cochran. He was from Bridgewater. He was a great athlete, led it in five sports at Boston University, and played for the Philadelphia Athletics and the Detroit Tigers, and won five pennants and three World Series, and two American League Most Valuable Player Awards. He was a fiery competitor. His career ended when his skull was fractured by a pitch, but he made it to Cooperstown, uh, the only Plymouth County native again to be elected to Cooperstown. There's a plaque in his honor at a youth baseball field on Bri in Bridgewater, right off of Route 18. In honor of the Columbus Day holiday, uh, there were a lot of uh, Italian immigrants that came to Plymouth County, uh, including Brockton in North Plymouth, where there is the Giuseppe Garibaldi Club. North Plymouth was home to many Italian immigrants. Many worked and joined social clubs. Uh, it was established in 1933. It relocated to Castle Street in 1948. And it really um, is there in honor of Giuseppe Garibaldi, who united Italy uh, from far and rural. He was brave, and his accomplishments uh, made him a hero to Italian American immigrants. There are statues of him all over the world, including Rome, New York City, and other squares around the world. The Garibaldi Club continues to operate today. Uh, next, uh, Pope's Tavern. So Pope's Tavern is what is now the Halifax Council on Aging. However, it was a tavern many years ago. In October of 1830, a Republican a congressional convention was held there where they elected John Quincy Adams, who had formerly been a president of the United States, to Congress for this district. And he had pre previously lost the president to Andrew Jackson. He's the only American president to be a president and later serve in Congress. Halifax is the heart of Plymouth County. Pope's Tavern catered to visitors coming up and down different parts of the county, and it's a beautiful spot if you ever have a chance to go there. And we always talk about one of our colonial records. The life in 17th century Plymouth Colony was very interesting. We talked uh, last month how they used fines to control people. In this particular month, we're talking about a vote of the colonial court, whereby individuals that um, bought things and sold them for a great profit, were condemned uh, as usury. Uh, there's one here of Mr. Hopkins that bought a looking glass, and he sold it for three times the price that he paid for it. And it was really frowned on by the court because they thought people that did that were taking advantage of people that was not uh, within their culture. So we'll continue to show those colonial records as we go forward. I want to thank our friends here at PAC TV for helping me produce this show. Lorna Baker and Christine Richards from my office. We continue to do this show monthly. 
talking about our numbers for the month, always have a great guest, and talking about our great Plymouth colony and Plymouth County history. And we hope you have a good end of October. Happy Halloween, and we'll see you next month.